Daniel, já estamos? Ok. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first, uh, second afternoon of the third international workshop of Structuralist Development Macroeconomics. Now we'll have a special section about the comparative economic development of India, Brazil, and Argentina. Uh, we have our guests, Professor Hagav from Bangalore, uh, Professor Gabriel Palasso from the University of Buenos Aires, and me from the University of Brasilia, uh, telling about the Brazilian experience. Uh, we will begin with Professor Hagav for his exposition. How many minutes did you need? 30 minutes, okay. Uh, 30 minutes for uh, each exposition. I think that is, it will be interesting. And after uh, the expositions, we will open to, to people to ask questions that they want to make with the two presenters, okay? So, Hagaf, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jose, and thanks for this warm welcome. And it's a great privilege and honor to be here in the third uh, workshop, Structural Developmental Macro. And it's been wonderful here to receive such a warm welcome here. I didn't, it's very welcome here. And thank you for, well, thank you for uh, giving your time. And I'm grateful that the ambassador is here and, and the director is here and we'll see if we get some good productive discussions from, from all our uh, presentations. So what I wanted to do today is to, initially I had a presentation which was more academic in terms of trying to understand the structural change growth. But after seeing the discussions and presentations, I kind of changed my mind. And uh, so I'm going to give you an overview of the structural change in India and talk about the challenges and the opportunities. And you will see some similarities, some dissimilarities between Brazil and Argentina and so on. That's my plan, we'll see. So we saw from, uh, okay, how am I supposed to do this? Ah. Sorry, sorry. So we saw from uh, yesterday's uh, presentation of Professor Jose that the classical pattern of development is essentially a process of reallocation uh, from low productivity sectors to high productivity sectors. That's the classical pattern. So that structural change is growth with development. So just ferrying workers from low productivity, initially agriculture and then to services. So the celebrated models of Lewis and Kristnitz, they conceptualized and elucidated such a pattern of development okay, in simple models. The past experiences of today's developed economies in Europe, North America, you know, where manufacturing led the key role okay, in, in, in the growth process at the early stages. So manufacturing lifted the economy from agriculture, subsistence agriculture, and then later on, you know, the services picked up and that's how the classical pattern happened in currently developed economies like North America and Europe. So structural change accordingly is associated with the growth involved in labor reallocation. That's, that's the way, that's the way, you know, uh, from agriculture to both manufacturing and services in the early stages and then from agriculture and manufacturing into services. Okay, that's the way uh, examples of, of this kind of development is you can see Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Taiwan, uh, China, and Vietnam. These are the late developers. Early developers are the North American. Um, so the well-known uh, Caldor's growth laws, they try to understand the economic logic that underpinned this kind of a transfer. That was Caldor's contribution, Caldor and Thirwal that we saw in yesterday's presentation. So the, the first is the growth of labor productivity okay, in, is typically much faster in manufacturing than in agriculture or services initially. 
Then, because of increasing returns in, in, in manufacturing, while well, agriculture faces diminishing returns to scale and constant returns to scale and services provide at the same time. So, thus, rising manufacturing you know, uh, output is associated with labor productivity. So, that's going to pull up. Second, the low income uh, economy, demand for manufacturers grows faster than, the, than that of agricultural commodities, that we know, elasticity or income elasticity of manufactured goods. And the third characteristic is the manufacturing is its ability to employ relatively low skilled people that are coming out of agriculture. These are kind of well established growth laws, uh, Calvin's growth laws. So these characteristics of manufacturing explain why they play the engine of growth in the early stages of development. Okay, interactions around the demand side and supply side, we saw in the presentation, both productivity and demand, uh, they reinforce each other. So production growth brings income growth at, at lower prices, which given high income elasticity of demand for manufacturing, bring a rapid growth of demand, which in turn stimulates production growth. It's a kind of self-reinforcing virtuous cycle. So in the low income economy, the growth of manufacturing can be both rapid and self-sustained for people. Okay. And it can thus be an engine of growth. So this is the classical pattern that we are seeing. Okay. Now, how are things change as economies develop? and incomes increase. For one thing, the income elasticity of demand for manufacturers decline, while the services increase. As our income increases, you start consuming more services. Secondly, precisely the labor productivity grows rapidly. The ability of manufacturing to absorb labor declines. So it's not, no, not able to absorb the labor that are coming out from agriculture. So after a certain level of development that's being achieved, the service sector takes over, okay? Man the manufacturing lead as a lead role in the growth process. Yielding, this is the classical pattern of yes. Now, this is the empirical, empirically observed across, you know, developed countries, early developers. And as you can see, this is the inverted U-shaped uh, pattern that, they, you know, emerged. So initially manufacturing uh, picks up, and then it reaches a certain peak, and then it turns around. Okay, this is the developed. And the peak can happen at different levels of GDP per capita. Uh, some countries will have a peak much earlier if the labor productivity growth is very, very high. Some other countries will have a later peak. But this is the inverted U shape. And a classic paper by Herendorf, and they actually showed when the peak happened, oh, this doesn't work. The peak happens in the agriculture and the, when the, sorry, peak happens in the manufacturing. When it turns around, services picks up exactly at the same point. This is Herendorf's paper, which is a very celebrated paper in you know, development that they actually showed in, in the case of developed countries as, as they reach the peak and plateau and go to turn around, services pick, picks up. Now, this, this, this we all know. I mean, this is the classical pattern that we, we, we have studied in the textbooks and we have actually experienced in terms of... Um, now, as I said, the peak happens through different levels of GDP. Empirically, we have shown in the literature there's an unconditional convergence between developing countries and developed countries in terms of manufacturing. Okay? So this means that the growth of labor productivity in manufacturing is, is faster in today's developing countries than you know, developed countries. So an implication is that the employment share in manufacturing can be expected to reach its peak much in a much shorter time period in the developing countries. So that you see in Japan. In Japan's case, the employment share of manufacturing increased from 9% to the peak of 25% over a period of 83 years. Whereas in South Korea's case, the peak happened in just 23 years. Whereas the UK's case, the manufacturing peak was 34% in 1871, when its per capita GDP was just $5,800, declined very slowly to 31% in 1971. So the, the deindustrialization was stretched for almost 100 years in case of UK. Now, does that imply the late developers, you know, experience, they reach the peak and decline 
you know, earlier at the lower per capita uh, GDP. Is that premature deindustrialization that happens in, you know, developing countries at a much lower GDP per capita? One can't say it with certainty because of the it's a it's a dynamics between productivity and demand dynamics. You know, that self-reinforcing effect. Which one offsets what? So the employment share in manufacturing will continue to rise as long as the demand effect outweighs the productivity gains. Okay. So with higher growth, and as the pattern of demand shifts from manufacturing products to services, the demand effect can get weaker and the turnaround of the virtuous cycle start to begin. This is this is the well-known pattern of development across the world. Now, from this perspective, okay, the question is, what about India's you know, experience? So the recent experience, in short, if you want, this is the slide, you can go back to your offices. <laughs> so <laughs> essentially, you don't have to wait for the whole next. In short, the recent experience in India seems anomalous to the documented pattern of development. So the rapid service growth, absolutely flat manufacturing growth, very slowly, gradually declining agriculture growth. This, this is a signature in India that we see. You can come from very different perspectives. If you, you can look at it, look at the data from very different perspective. Finally, you will come to this conclusion. Okay, the fall in agriculture is not as rapid as we expect from theory. Manufacturing is flat for, you know, for 20, 30 years. Employment share, share in manufacturing is flat. Services grow. Okay, that's services is picked up. So structural change accompanying this growth process naturally has not confirmed the classical pattern of development that we see around the world. And Indian experience defies Caldor's growth law okay, in, that, in that sense. So however, the recent literature claims that this services can be the engine of growth. Okay, like manufacturing was in the previous era, now it is the time of services. So India is a service-led growth, example of a service-led growth. Services has, have reached that kind of a potential like a manufacturing where they can employ people who absorb, you know, uh, people from uh, agriculture and so on. So services has replaced the older engine of growth. Form. So this is the claim by people like uh, Subramanian was the, um, uh, he was the advisor to PM, chief economic advisor to prime minister uh, for a number of years. Um, so his client, he's also a colleague in, in Asim Prem. He comes one semester, he teaches there in Asim Prem University. He is now working on a big book on India and China. All right, so that, that's his, um, th there's a group of people who claim that services are the engine of growth, no, not, not manufacturing. In, in. So let's look at the pattern of structural change. So, you know, you can see the growth uh, in Indian case, that, well, you know, history of Indian economy, I don't want to get into that now. It, it's by itself, it's a, it's a lecture, but you can see that 50s, 47 is when we got independence, you know, 50s, we started our planning process. The first thing was the capital goods constraint that we faced. So five-year plans from, from the 50s, so 52 was the second five-year plan where our constraint was capital goods constraint. We didn't have enough savings, so capital goods were not there, so invest in heavy manufacturing. And that actually lifted you know, growth uh, from minus to 3.5% uh, that you see there. And then 60s, we got into food crisis. There was no, this was the wage goods crisis constraint that we, that we faced in India. And there's no enough food, uh, so tackle that. There was a devaluation happened and, and so on and so forth. And the, the slogan changed a little bit in terms of eradicating poverty. The focus was about poverty elevation and, and so on. So this period from let's say 60s, late 60s or 70s to 80s, India went into this productionist mode, protectionist mode, you know, industrial uh, protection with import substitution regime that, that picked up the growth or it stagnated the growth if you see it from different perspectives and so on. So there, there was a argument that India got into this Hindu rate of growth about 4% during the period because of this uh, protection and, and you know, inefficiencies in public sector allocation and so on and so on. 
Then came the, the uh, foreign exchange constraint, that is 90s, uh, 90s, 1991. India didn't have money to pay for its import. So, you know, it goes to IMF to uh, get money, get loans, and the conditionality is kicking. And there was a complete change, you know, a total diametrically opposite set of policies. You open the economy, liberalize privatization of, uh, you know, state assets and globalization and so on. So from 1990 to current period, so that period is our kind of uh, open economy, uh, open the economy and liberalize economy and so on. So that people argue that that is the, that is the phase that picked up the Indian growth. So Indian, today's current growth is about 6.7% and so on. It, it's going to continue for, the, the prediction is, is going to continue for some time. But there was also, it, it's founded not just on the numbers of, of GDP growth, but it's also about the demographic transition that is happening. For the next 20, 30 years, Indian um, dependency ratio are going to be the lowest in the world. So China's dependency ratio was lowest in, in 2010, and again, it's not picked up, whereas Indian dependency ratios you know, will, will decline throughout 19, uh, 2030s, 2040s, we'll have the lowest in the world's average. So with, with that, that will be a, at least expected to be a big boost for, for Indian economy for the growth to This is a growth story. Now, and the structural change, what about the structural change? So you can compare in terms of headline uh, figures, you can compare it with China, because that's, you can see the comparing, contrasting experience between China and India. As you can see, the um, agriculture declines, but the, the rapidity of decline in China, we survey the rapidity of decline in India. Okay? Manufacturing is stagnant in India from 1955 to 2010, and manufacturing is, so Chinese growth is manufacturing-led growth, that manufacturing was the engine of growth, whereas in Indian case, manufacturing is stuck at 11%. And uh, these are employment shares. Okay, so, and services picked up from 9.10% or 10 to about 27% in, in 2010. And it's now 50% uh, of the economy. China, again, services picked up, but the service pickup is on the back of manufacturing led growth. Okay, so that's the difference between India and China. Now, so you can see the, as I said, the striking difference between uh, these two countries is the stagnant uh, manufacturing in India, pace of slower decline of agriculture. So agriculture is not releasing, you know, workers from that sector as as fast as as, as the modern classical models. Um, so between seventy eight to two thousand ten, the employment share in agriculture declined by twenty percentage points in India, whereas it's thirty four. Okay. So China is much more of manufacturing, right? Employment in state, uh, in the employment share of services in, in India increased much faster in China than in India. Between 2000 to 2010, service growth is about three percentage points in India, whereas in China, it was about seven percentage points. Now, this is the you know, share of manufacturing uh, uh, you know, and industry. So industry is manufacturing plus construction plus mining. So, some you know, people use it, um, and most important part is the construction part we, we will see later on in Indian case. So this is the share of manufacturing and so um oh, do yeah, I should this. So this is the share of employment across sectors between 1990 and 2020. You'll see agriculture is falling, and then as you can see, the fall is not as as fast. Then you have the services, which is picking up. Manufacturing is almost a straight line. Construction, as you can see, 2000, after 2010 onwards, construction picks up, you know, for, so the industry picked up due to construction M1. And uh, sectoral shares, uh, you know, it's agriculture is 47 in, in two time periods between 2011 to 2012. And, you know, it is 41. Point four in between 2018 and 19. Construction, as you can see, construction is 10.7 and 12.2, where manufact manufacturing is almost constant. And services, you know, it has seen the growth. Now, 
historically rapid industrialization is associated with heavy metal, heavy machinery industry. That's that's what. It is. So if you look at the industry-wise distribution of workforce and manufacturing, you can see the uh, I had actually marked. It's not showing up. So the heavy metal manufacturing. So that is the the share of metals, you know, in in in, in machinery in, of manufact in manufacturing, as the evidence of growing maturity of of industry, uh, domestic industry with higher income elasticity of demand. However, in India's experience, it seems that variance with the historical uh, pattern that we have seen before. Heavy metals, you know, heavy manufacturing declined from 18% in 1991 to 15% in 2011, whereas light manufacturing, so the heavy metal manufacturing is the number nine, number 10, and number 11. Okay, basic metals, machinery, and electrical and optical equipments, uh, and transport equipment, all these are heavy uh, manufacturing. Whereas light manufacturing is number one, uh, food, beverages, and tobacco. Uh, if I can get this up a little bit. Uh, yeah, food, beverage, and tobacco, you know, as you can see, and the textile and textile products and leather, footwear, they are the, they are the majority in uh, the way they've grown. So light manufacturing increased from 58% to 66% uh, in 2011. So light manufacturing is one, two, three, uh, four and uh, seven. So all these, if you add up, you'll get this, um, you know, 58 to 66 percent in 2010. So there's a change in the basket in the way we specialize. So manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, was down with light manufacturing. Okay. So possibly it's a relative decline in in domestic machinery, uh, in a growing import dependency, and, and so on. This this is this is uh, we have uh, okay. So the yeah spatial pattern. So that that was the composition as you as you saw the change. Interestingly, the spatial pattern is also quite interesting in India. This is not my data. This is you know, two researchers in Bombay. This is the district level share of household manufacturing workers. We serve non household manufacturing workers. So this is uh, between 2011 and uh, between 1991 and 2011. So look at 1991 data of district-wise household manufacturing workers, which are being non-household manufacturing workers. So the household manufacturing workers are concentrated in northern and eastern states of India, whereas non-household manufacturing workers are concentrated on southern and western parts of India, okay? This is 1991. You might expect the pattern has changed in uh, 2011. No, the pattern remains quite stable in terms of the district-wise data. So share of household manufacturing. So household, even within manufacturing, household manufacturing is concentrated in northern and eastern part of India and non-household, like going to a factory, factory-based uh, working or employment is concentrated on southern states and western states. So Tamil Nadu is one of the biggest states. Andhra Pradesh, where the abandoned is is from, and a bigger state. You have Maharashtra on the east coast, Bombay, where is the capital city, and Gujarat, where the prime minister is from. You know, So this whole eastern and southern belt is, is kind of you know, so this is a spatial pattern, and that's quite stable in Indian case, right? So this is about the manufacturing sector. Okay? Now the service sector, as you can see, it picked up quite rapidly, and you know, it's it's kind of gone to 50, 52 percent now in terms of share of service in GDP, and even in net value added, it's about 50. So service is quite strong in terms of its performance. And uh, uh, this is all the recent data on the growth of service sectors that various uh, picked up all this from the government reports uh, about 54% in uh, 2021. Then the growth in service sector that contribute uh, essentially to exports are 
IT and IT enabling services. This is enabled services that include that IT business cost management, financial services, and so on and so forth. So the bulk of service exports comes from these uh, IT and IT enabled services that we have we have uh, seen, and the share of you know different subsectors in the service sector, from public administration to transport to financial services, to trade, repairs, hotels and restaurants, real estate, ownership of dwellings and, and professional services. As you can see, trade, repairs and hotels and restaurants is a, is a major chunk. Real estate, ownership of dwelling, professional services, you know, cleaning, laundry services, you know, these kind of professional services, they are, they are a major chunk. Financial services, they have a major and you have transport, public administration, and other services. Other services include all kinds of, you know, like iFood, for instance, you know, these kind of services that uh, give you fetch food from one place to the other. All that come into this. So this is the sub-sector classification within the service sector, okay? Now, so from 2000 to 2010, the period of rapid uh, growth in India, the employment share in services increased only 3%. So as you can see, the, the export sector is mainly high-skilled, high-productivity sectors of IT and IT enabled, whereas the bulk of employment that is happening in the, in the low-productivity sectors within the service sector. Okay? So the employment elasticity, if you looked at, I mean, this is a very nice paper in Cambridge Journal of Economics. Um, if you looked at these sub-sectors and service sectors, so Caldor word on KV coefficients, as we as we see, it's kind of you can think of it as an employment uh, elasticity uh, coefficient. So lower the coefficient means it's absorbing more labor. Higher the coefficient means it's 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 not absorbing labor at all. So coefficient equal to one means the growth is coming entirely from productivity. And growth is almost zero point one means growth is coming from labor transfer. Okay, that's the way to interpret the Caldor word on coefficient. So as you can see, wholesale, retail trade, hotels and restaurants, transport, all are kind of low KV coefficient. That means they are absorbing more labor. Okay, they are growing by employment, labor transfer, whereas financial intermediation, real estate, you know, they have a slightly higher KV coefficient. That means they're growing by productivity, higher productivity rather than labor transfer. Yeah. Oh, all right. So so KV coefficients in the aggregate sector uh, between 2005 to 2010. So, okay, I have to rework my time. So in terms of contribution to service sector, to wholesale, retail, trade, so these are the sectors that give you employment rather than which are low productivity and high productivity sectors are not, they're actually giving you higher value added. They're going for exports, fine. So, what about the types of employment? So this, oh, I had marked so many things here. Oh. <laughs> Fine, it's all gone. So the types of employment is, you know, first you look at organized and unorganized sector. Um, as you can see, the share of employment in the unorganized sector is about 71, 72% uh, or yeah, 72% to 70%, almost 70% is unorganized sector. Whereas if you look at from formal and informal, if you classify this way, you can see the informal employment and services is about 85, average is about 85, and the formal manufacturing, formal service is only 15%. So formal and informal is only employment, there's a contractual employment and formal, whereas informal there is no contract and you know, you're um, including zero you know, contract and so on. So you can see the within the service sector, you know, the employment is happening at the low productivity sectors, but the low productivity type of employment is kind of much more informal and unorganized. Okay. Now, this is the share of organized employment in some segments within the within the service sector. Education is high, obviously. Universities and colleges, then health, social work, hotels and restaurants much lower. This is the organized sector is only seven point eight percent. Trade and transport very very low. Right. So. And you can you can look at it from very different dimensions. You know, types of employment by sectors. Look at agriculture. Look at manufacturing, non-manufacturing services, and so on. Whichever way you see, you can you can see in agriculture, 
very interestingly, own account workers, or what we call a self-employed workers, their share is very high in agriculture, as well as in services, right? Services, the own account workers are quite high. The unpaid family workers, that is very high in agriculture. Unpaid family work in services is about 10, 11 to 10%, 11 to, yeah, 11, 10, and 7%. So total of self-employed workers is about, in, in service sector, is about 55 to 60, 62% range between 2004 to 2012. Whereas, you know, uh, this, is, this is another characterization that you have to take into account. So in the share of overall employment, self-employed is a category that you have to take into account apart from cash flow work and salary work. There are three categories, salary work, cash flow work, and self-employed. Self-employed is about 50% in, 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 in this case. So the, you can clearly see the dual nature of service-led growth here, that the share of these services, the GDP has increased, no doubt about it, definitely. But service-led growth is driven primarily by digitally, digitally transformed services, IT and IT-enabled services like technology, communication, financial, and, and business services. So between 2000, uh, you know, the trade balance in these services is surplus. You know, as you can see, they, they dominate the exports. So India's export-led growth, export items is skill intensive rather than labor intensive manufacturers, okay? But the trade balance has been positive and significantly only for software services, which, you know, accounted for about 18% of the total uh, service output in 2012. The trade balance in other digitally transformed services like accounting and so on, that you showed negative. Moreover, the growth in non-traded services, this is the important bit, but that's the duality here. Non-traded services, which accounted for the bulk of service output, you know, has also been rapid, though relatively less rapid than the you know technically uh, technological uh, company. So it looks like the bulk of demand for services has been driven largely by domestic. Uh, demand. So where is this demand come from? So if you look at the share of distribution in equal, on a, in a bottom 50 to middle 49% and top 1%, you know, the top 10%, if you add this 9 and 1, you'll get the top 10% increase their share from 33 to 54% between 1990 and 2012, about a 65% increase. Consequent change Consequently, change in the pattern of demand, my elasticity for non traded service. So, demand internal, domestic demand is, is coming from the upper uh, segment of the distribution. The second source of the FDI force that, you know, which went not just into IT and IT enabled services, uh, but also went into non trade services like malls, you know, supermarkets, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So this this is FDI nature of FDI in India is not earlier it was you know you set up a plant and that still happens in the southern and western states you know um, uh, I you know like behind my house there is a huge lot, lot of land Mercedes Benz is building something uh, for their for their thing so there is a manufacturing that happens in the southern and western states there is an investment that is coming in but also equity investment that's flowing in terms of FDI okay. now. So information technology, so this is the duality in the service sector. Now, the main argument that is made by Subramanian and others that, you know, it's, 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 it's a service-led growth, you know, that digital transformation is transforming. Uh, India's, it has acquired some character of manufacturing. It has to be taken, taken with some kind of, uh, so for services to drive the structural change, it has to absorb labor moving out of agriculture and manufacturing, but manufacturing is flat, so it has to absorb. So, but what we see in the data from the employment elasticity is low for high productive services, okay? So employment elasticity is high for low, uh, low productivity uh, services like wholesale and vegan. Labor moving out of agriculture absorbed by low productivity services. As we saw, these sectors are highly informal, low wage, and also greater levels of self-employment in these sectors. So the missing piece in the puzzle, again, the duality is fine. The missing piece is this, that India's labor force participation, female labor force participation fell drastically, right? From 1977 to 
it actually it's now about 15 percent you know it's like urban between urban and rural areas it's let's say 20 percent on an average this is dramatic for where are these women going there's a missing women in indian indian story right so india in, uh, approximately 450 million women you know are the, in the, they fall in the working age of 15 to 64 but the labor force participation declined sharp. So it's about 17.5% in 2008, which averaged about 20%. Now, where, where is India standing in all the developing countries? In terms of GDP per capita, you can see India is outlier. India is clearly an outlier in terms of female labor force participation. You know, they, this is a puzzle. We don't know. Okay. The story, the one way to look at it is you can see own account workers, you know, the self-employed, unpaid family workers in agriculture, and so on. This is one, one type of story that is trying to talk about why is the female level participation very low in India, right? Now, um, the female employment in manufacturing services, in urban areas, it's much, um, it's relatively higher than the rural areas in terms of self-employed and unpaid workers and so on. Um, and the other characterization, the, the labor market is segregated in terms of caste. Caste-wise segregation, caste and religion. So Brahmin, high caste, OBC is the backward caste, and Dalit is the lower caste, uh, below backward caste. In Adivasi are the tribals, Muslims, Sikh, and Christians, as you can see, you know, labor market segmentation by caste is also quite interesting in India. And then, you know, so there are certain sectors where you have, you know, dominated by Brahmins, and there are other sectors where the service workers and so on, is much more the other uh, caste and other women. So this is the labor market segmentation in terms of uh, caste. I'll finish it quickly. So in conclusion, three distinctive features of structural change stand out. Agriculture share is falling gradually, fine. The, the employment share in manufacturing failed to increase, which tells the story of non-industrialization. India is not even industrialized. There's no deindustrialization. India is not industrialized in the first place. Rapid growth in services, which we saw as a duality. Okay? So the pace of structural change has been too low, which suggests a very slow uh, improvement in the employment. Possible way forward, we will talk about skill generation. Yes, that is one. Current emphasis about skill generation to absorb labor. Industrialization strategies is very much on the cards. However, industrialization strategy, not in the conventional sense. Growth obsessed development strategy must be replaced because we have been crossing this river all the time, right? Many times during the COVID pandemic, we have seen that the fragility of such conventional growth uh, led development process. Economies without proper care, safety net, public health, and social care suffered the most. So we need industrialization strategy, but it has to be socially embedded, okay? And buttress and reinforce the social reproduction of labor and equality. It reinforces what Oslam talked about yesterday in terms of care investment for strengthening social infrastructure. You know, that's the pillar of the strategy. But we must go beyond that and invest in enabling services that enabling services in the care infrastructure as well. For example, intimate partner violence is, is one of the violence at home, violence in the workplace, violence in public places and so on. That is one of the major issues for women not being able to realize their potentials and capabilities and so on. I mean, we, we did, I've worked in this area for some time, multi-country study. The, you know, we looked at from a input output SAM based multiplier models, how much is the leaking? Because women don't go to work after uh, episodes of violence. So the prevalence rate is 30% in, a, in, a, in an economy. If they don't go to, just by absenteeism, they can't work. Because of, uh, so you can see the leakage from, you know, due to violence is about 08 to 0.9% of GDP. So this is, yeah. So rethinking development means we need to rethink you know, these basic concepts like potential output and so on. So potential output, the level of output that could be produced with, you know, with what is excluded, both gender, race, and, and so on. So I, I leave it there with Robert Frost's uh, poem. So this is something that we need to think of. 
do we need to take the path that we already traveled? We need to, you know, we need to take the path that we have not traveled before. This was available to us, we didn't take it. Now we need to have the courage to travel in the path but not take it. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank many thanks, uh, Professor Hagaf. Now, Professor Gabriel Palazzo from the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, Gabriel, the floor is yours. Yes. Yes, I think this one. No. I know the PDF. Should the PDF? No. Ah, it's fine. Flat. this way okay okay perfect so thank you very much for having me here thank you Jose Luis, for the invitation i'm very happy to be here because it's like it's feel like home you now because we are talking a lot about real exchange rate yesterday and today during the morning and because i i i, I identify myself myself as a structuralist development and macroeconomics it's like a, there is a lot of things that were already told by Jose Luis that I'm going to show the data, the data. No, I'm going to be the guy that's going to show the data about how the real exchange rate impact in tradable purpose. So this is a paper, I mean, I, I suppose to talk about Argentina. This is a paper about Argentina. My presentation is going to be more academic. No, it's, it's going to be about one paper, but I think that this important paper, that's why I wrote it. No, that's the joke. But, <laughs> I didn't, but but, but I, I I like this paper. And it's it's co-authored with Martin Rapetti, that is also a professor at the University of Buenos Aires. So the paper is called "From Macro to Micro and Macro Back: Macroeconomic Trade Elasticity in Development Bar. I'm going to explain the title later, but macroeconomic trade elasticity means real exchange rate elasticity and also income elasticity, no? For export and import. So I'm going to talk all the time about real most of most of the time about real exchange rate is elasticity. In the paper, we also have some conclusions about the income elasticity, but I'm going to focus on, on real exchange elasticity. So this is the outline. I'm going to speak about the motivation and the contribution. I will try to explain why we are very obsessed with the real exchange rate in Latin America, So because there is a debate around that. So that, that that's, that's why. Then I'm going to show you two set of results, some from macro to micro, and then from micro, from micro, from micro to macro. No, I'm going. I'm going back to the macro, and then I'm going to show you the conclusions. So, okay, I'm not seeing the title of the slide, but it's okay. This is the motivation and contribution. So the question is: elasticity pessimist or optimist? No, that's the debate in some sometimes here in Latin America. We have some guys, some scholar, very, very well-known scholar that says that the real exchange rate do not have any role in tradable performance. No? Also in imports, that is more weird, but particularly in export, they say, okay, maybe you have a devaluation, but you do not see that your export volume increase. So it's weird to be obsessed to having a competitive real exchange rate because it has, may have distributional consequence. So don't, can, don't try to use the exchange rate for this. No? But then there is another kind of literature that today Professor Jofai Schwab was talking about that, for example, Roderick 2008, that found a positive correlation between real exchange and devaluation and growth. So there, there is like a puzzle. And the question is, who is right? Maybe nobody's right. I, I believe that nobody's right, actually. I mean, 
I mean, I, I'm I'm quite optimistic, but 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 for me the answer depends, no, and, and that's the key. And actually, in this paper, we try to build a bridge between both of them. No, we try to do that. No, so for me, the key word here is heterogeneity. No, the real exchange rate is going to affect very differently to different set of problems. So that's from macro to micro. No, because we have a macro variable the real exchange rate that affects to the productive structure in the different way. No? So I, I'm actually, I'm going to state, estimate the elasticity at product level. No? But then, because there is some kind of products that react more to exchange rate and other kind of, other kind of products that react less, you, the aggregate level of the real exchange rate elasticity no, if you take if you take account of your trade basket, could be influenced by your specialization. No? So specializing in different set of products is playing different levels of aggregate real exchange rate elasticity. So for me, it's like productive ma structure matters for the macro because the real exchange rate elasticity is an important variable for macroeconomics model because it's going to 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 have something to say for external adjustment, no? But the macro also matters for the product structure because influence in different way to different set of products. So it's, it's an interesting macro meeting direction. Now that it's something that in the school of thought of a structural development macroeconomics think that, that we should take into account. So this is, okay. I, I need to change this because the title has information about what I'm speaking. So this is the first contribution, no? That is from macro to micro, no? First, we find a wide heterogeneity responses of export import to the real exchange rate, a level and the aggregate demand, demand no? At product level. So this is very disaggregated estimation. We observe higher real exchange rate elasticity in low, and media technology products, also in high technology products. And if you use the, another kind of, of classification, no, the Rauch classification that divide between differentiated products and homogeneous products, we also find higher real exchange rate elasticity in the differentiated products. No? So, so if someone thinks that it's important to industrialize your country because some of the mechanisms that we were talking during the morning and also uh, before. So the real exchange rates has, has, has had something to do with that. No? Also, it's interesting that the, the, the high technology the manufacturing products, but all manufacturing products are also very elastic to the nominal exchange rate stability. So this is why in, we always say we need a, a stable and competitive real exchange rate because it's like you are going to foster these kind of products. And also it was one of the hypotheses of Roddick paper that he was saying, okay, the, the real exchange and devaluation foster modern sector and that, that's why you have a higher rate of growth in, in those economies. Okay. The second contribution is in the other way around. When we weight the individual product elasticity that we estimated by the share in the Argentina trade basket, we are getting low real exchange rate elasticity, elasticity, elasticities in exports in Argentina. Why? Because 60% of our uh, exports are in primary products, our soybeans or, and derivatives of, of soybeans. So in this sense, pessimists are right. You, you can't expect a very high increase in the, in the total volume of export if you depreciate because, okay, you are specializing in those products that, that don't have a very high real exchange rate uh, last In imports, it's more or less the same because we, our trade basket in import is diversified and so, so the specialization doesn't matter. So it's more or less the same as the simple average of elasticity estimated at individual L level. So it is important or it's not important the real exchange rate. So I, I think that we have a composition problem or a structural bias problem. problem. No? So 
in, in aggregate terms, it's not important for Argentina, but it's important if you want to develop these kind of sectors that are manufacturing sectors. So also in aggregate terms, if I saw, if, if I sum the real exchange rate elasticity of import and exports in absolute values, I get a, a coefficient higher than one. That means that Marshall Lerner is fulfilled in, in my estimation. So it's still, it's going to be useful for external adjustment, but, but I think that Marshall Lerner doesn't matter for, for our kind of economies, but, but that's, that uh, is another discussion. So uh, we're going to have, of course, an asymmetric uh, assessment between export and import because exports in aggregate level respond less than that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the empirical strategy, and then I'm going to show you the results. So we, we estimate microeconomic trade elasticity for Argentina using a database composed of, of export and imports at four digits of a standard international trade classification in constant dollars from 1980 to the 2015. Oh, that's our database. We use this method that is called mean group that calculates all individual product elasticity using time series technique. It's, it's just as running one regression for each product. No? But then it reports the simple average elasticity and use the variance of the elasticity estimated to perform inference, to know if it's statically significant or not. No? So this has, I believe that have different kind of uh, advantages. Probably the most important for us right now is the second one that we can ana analyze heterogeneity in different products. So we can recover all the coefficients of our estimation also, I believe that in countries like Argentina, Brazil, and other Latin American countries, it's important because most of the estimation that use aggregate data of exports do not control for, for example, climate events for drugs. No? And for example, in a country like Argentina, this year we have a very huge drought. It, don't, it didn't rain in, in all the summer. So our export volume decreased 20%. And that could pressure in the real exchange rate, of course. But this is a problem of re a reverse causality because you have one of your products that is very important is decreasing for an exogenous uh, cost. And if you are not controlling for that, you are going to see a devaluation and a decrease of export and your estimated elasticity do not make sense. So you have to control that. Believe me that most of the studies do not control that. And if you calculate this in a very desegregated level, you are all, maybe you can have that problem, but for only one product, not for the rest of the product. So you, you are getting more or less okay elasticity in the rest of the of the estimation. So I, I think that also because of that, it's also important. Uh, or it's, it's a good empirical strategy. So from macro to micro. Now, do all, do all sectors of product respond in the same way to the real chain rate symbol? Is that the question I want to address? And I think when I address this question, I feel a bridge between pessimists and optimists, oh, because it's, it's, it's key. So this is the, the question that I am estimating. The, the left side of the, of the question are the logs of exports in, in one specification. In another, it's the log of imports in constant uh, dollars. Then we have the lags of the export and imports. Then we have the real effective exchange rate and its lags, no? Then I have a variable that, that try to proxy a international demand or foreign demand is trade partner GDP. In the case of a import is GDP of Argentina. And then I have different kinds of control that are important. One are important in export or are important in, in imports. So in export, just to try to be, to keep it simple, I'm only going to show you the results of our preferred estimation that is the one that controls for the nominal change rate stability. No, I, I'm only going to show that, that regression. I think that is very important to control for nominal change rate stability because how the real exchange rate impact to export. No? It's not because when you have a depreciation, you are going to start selling your products cheaper to the rest of the world and you are going to have an increase in demand that do not have 
no, the, the price is at the, more or less fixed in dollars. So the thing that is happening is that you have an increase of, of, of the amount that you are, you are getting after a depreciation, no? And so you are, you are having a higher profitability and the higher profitability foster investment in, this, in those sectors. And, then, and only then you just start producing more and exporting more. So, but you are only going to invest if you expect that this higher profit, profitability lasts for some time. So nominal exchange stability makes sense to try to cap capture that because if you have, if you can't just a devaluation and then you have an appreciation until the same level, you're not going to see anything because nothing in investment is going to happen. So you have to have a depreciation and a stability of the nominal change rate. So it's, that's why I think it's important. So this is some of the results for X. No? I only showing you the long run elasticity. No, after all the adjustments. So. The first column is when I estimate for all the products. No? Simple average elasticity. This is, I mean, this coefficient do not mean how much is going to, to be increased the export volume after the depreciation. It's the, the average, average simple elasticity of all the products of, of 502 products. So actually, I, I'm getting a quite high, high real exchange rate elasticity for all the products. But what, what happens if I start dividing my sample by different kind of classification? So in the second, in the from the second column until the sixth column, I use the last classification that divide in primary products is the first one, resource-based manufacturing products. No, uh, manufacturing rates related to natural resources, low technology products, medium technology products, high technology products. Yeah. The, the column seven, eight, and nine use the route classification that divide between differentiated products, reference prices, products, products that have reference price, international reference price, for example, soybean or, or something like that, and homogeneous products. No? So, what we see. Primary product has very low real exchange rate elasticity. Also, resource-based manufacturing products. But, but we found very high elasticity in low technology, in medium, te in medium technology, and also in high technology. It's not that high, high technology is not responding to the real exchange rate. So this is interesting because, it, I mean, there, there are a lot of people that, that are saying that, okay, we need to increase our manufacturing exports. So with the real exchange rate, maybe you are getting that, at least in Argentina, at least in my estimation. So, the same is if you, if you use the route classification, differentiated products have a higher a high elasticity, reference, pro, reference price products more or less, and omission products do not respond. So I, I think that this is interesting it's an interesting result. And also it's, in, it's very interesting, the elasticity to the nominal exchange rate stability, because look how the high technology manufacturers responds to the stability of the nominal exchange rate, much more than, for example, primary products or the other products. So it's, I mean, this is something that it's very, it's a very useful evidence for people that support the stable and competitive real exchange rate. Yeah, we, are get, we, are, we are getting those results that are very important. So for import, we, can, we should control, at least in Argentina, for the trade liberalization that we had in the 1990s. I think that that is, is our preferred regression. I'm going to show that regression here. The same structure in the table. Now first, all, all the probes, then LAL classification, and after that, crouch classification. And here we also find that kind of partner a little bit different. I mean, in all the cases, the real exchange rate is important as a significant result in, a, in all the cases, in all the products. That, that also makes sense because, I mean, if you devaluate, the prices of your import are going to be higher. So for sure you are going to substitute in, in, in some way with national products. So, but still, for example, low technology have 
a higher real exchange rate elasticity than, 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 than the other product. So also it's like you are substituting for, you are, you are substituting more in this kind of products. So the, the, the tradable production, the domestic tradable production, maybe is responding more to the devaluation. So the, and, and, and for Rauch, Rauch classification, the differences are very, very clear. So differentiated products are have a higher elasticity than products with reference price and then homogeneous products. So this is important for from a developmental point of view, no? Because it's like, okay, you have a macro variable that may, may have interesting results or, or effects to the to the structural change in some way. So but I'm also a, mac a macroeconomist. So I, I want to know how the, 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 the real exchange rate affects the aggregate export and the aggregate import. So the question is what will be the aggregate real exchange rate elasticity if we weigh them, our estimations, by the Argentina trade bas 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 basket? No? And also we can try to change, I mean, to, to, to use our estimation of elasticity, but instead of waiting by the Argentina trade basket, maybe wait for the world's trade ba basket, just to, to realize if there is a composition problem in, 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 in the results. And we got, we, we got that. No. So what is this table? No. The left panel is about imports, the right panel is about exports. The first column says what are the elasticity that I'm reporting. So I'm going to focus only on real exchange rate elasticity. No, the second column indicates which specification in the regression we are using. We have different kind of robustness tests, or we have different kind of specification. The first one in each table are our preferred regression of import and export. So in import, what happened when when we Weigh our C, our individual product elasticity by the by the share in the trade basket of Argentina. We got more or less the same as the simple average elasticity because we don't have a very clear specialization or, or concentration of the imports in any kind of product. So, and if we use the, the the shares of the of those products in the trade war in the in the world uh, trade basket we also get more or less the same result. But that, that changed a lot in the case of X. In the case of export, we are getting this very low real exchange rate elasticity if we wait by the shares of Argentina trade based basket, but multiplied by three if, if we use the world trade basket. And why, why is that? It's because the world trade basket is, is not specialized in in primary products, and we are. So, if some of the pessimism scholars see this result, is going to see we were right, no? But it's but the the structuralist development school sees if, if they see this result, they are going to say, okay, we are right. I think that both are right in some sense, no? But 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 but. That makes sense. I mean, uh, for me, it makes totally sense. So, what are the conclusions of the paper? For me, there is an interesting macro, micro, and micro macro interaction. No? The productive structure matters for the macro because it's going to define your aggregate level of real exchange rate elasticity that is important for external adjustment. So, but the macro also matters for the productive structure. Because if you have a no evaluation of your real exchange rate, you are going to have some kind of Dutch disease. I mean, it's, our results are the same of the Dutch disease. So for me, this is important to think about what is the macroeconomic environment that is helpful according to the international economic speci specialization that is desired. I mean, something that the policy maker would have to define. I mean, we want to go in this, in this, in this way or in another way, but the real exchange rate has, has something to do about that. So electricity pessimism or structural bias, I think that is both. I think that the key of our results is heterogeneity. 
Now we have a very heterogeneity results in different kind of problems. And of course, in the paper, we have a lot of robustness tests that uh, allow me to conclude that the results are robust enough to, to our conclusion. So that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Oops. Well, good uh, good afternoon for everybody. Uh, my slides are part in Portuguese, part in English, but I will speak in English so everybody can understand me. Well, uh, this uh, presentation actually is the first class of my undergraduate course. Uh, called the uh, uh, Brazilian Contemporaneous Economy. And in my first class of my undergraduate course, I told to the students that this course can be also named the rise and fall of Brazil. So the story that I will tell here today is about the rise and fall of Brazil. Uh, and this story has a lot to do with my the or origin of my family. As many of you know, I'm, I'm, I'm born in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, but my father is a Spanish and my mother Portuguese. My father immigrated from Spain in 1954 with 17 years old only. And my mother immigrated from Portugal in 1956. They met together in, I believe, 1969, 1970 in Rio de Janeiro. They married. And then I, I I was born, okay. But the the, the country that my parents moved, uh, Brazil at that time, was one of the highest uh, had one of the highest growth rate in the world. In the end of the seventies, Brazil was had the largest manufacturing. Uh, industry in the world, uh, the manufacturing output of Brazil is higher than the combined manufacturing output of China, India, and South Korea. We have the most sophisticated manufacturing industry of the developing world. Everything uh, uh, seems to, to tell to us that Brazil will came a world power by the by the end of the 20th century, that Brazil would be now as, for instance, China or India is. But unfortunately, something goes wrong since the 80s, and then we uh, simple uh, trapped in a middle income trap, uh, a trap that we are uh, no longer, uh, we, we didn't uh, uh, simple, have, has no capacity to, to, to get out. Okay, so this first slide is the uh, GDP growth rate, 10 year moving average, 10 year moving average of GDP growth rate in the Brazilian economy from 1930 to 2020. So as you can, oops, as we can see, uh, thing laser, this okay. É o botão grande. Okay, as you can see, uh, during the 30s and 40s, which basically uh, coincides with Getulio Vargas government, the GDP growth rate of Brazil was in an average of more or less four and a half percent per year. Okay, but uh, in the 50s, we had a uh, growth acceleration. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, during Getulio Vargas government and Juscelino Kubitschek government, Juscelino Kubitschek built this city, you know, Brasilia uh, that was inaugurated in 1960 uh, was designed to be a sign for all the world 
that Brazil was capable to do. It's, this is the words, not mine, but from President Juscelino Kubitschek. President Juscelino Kubitschek told that Brasilia was a sign to the world that Brazilians are, are capable to do whatever they want. So that's the meaning of the city. We can do a city in the middle of nothing and turn the city a huge capital city. That's the meaning of Brasilia. Okay, so with, uh, we accelerated our growth rate to more or less 6% in the 50s. And uh, we have a small growth crisis, growth crisis, not a crisis in the actual meaning of the term, but a small growth crisis in, in the beginning of the 60s. Mainly because of this growth crisis, the, the, the political uh, situation, the political contest for a state cup would surge, and we have the state cup of 1964. But uh, on contrary, what, what happened in other dictatorships, like, for instance, Argentina, Chile, uh, and other countries, the military government in Brazil remains a de developmentalist government. Okay? So it's, it's completely different from Argentina uh, and, and for Chile, uh, uh, our military, our developmentalists. So they can have a political uh, uh, fight with the, the left, uh, but they have the same goal of set economic development as the main goal of the Brazilian society. So in the 60s in the 19 between 1964 to 1967 a lot of uh, structural reforms were done by the so-called paeg uh, in portuguese plano de ação econômica do governo in english plan of economic action of government we had for instance uh, a reform on the financial sector that is very close to the one made by franklin roosevelt in the united states during the new deal so we have you know a segmented financial sector with commercial banks, investment banks. We create our uh, central bank in 1964, because before that, we do not have a central bank. Okay, So many structural changes uh, was were done during this period from 1964 to 1967. And then the course, the so-called economic miracle. During, uh, uh, you can see that from 1970, to 1967, the, we have a new growth acceleration. And on 1977, the GDP per capita of Brazilian economy was growing almost 10% per year in 10 average, in 10, 10 year moving average. Okay? So from the 1930 to 1977, Brazil experienced a growth acceleration. That uh, looks like that, okay, Brazil will, will, in the next 30 years, will be a developed country. We will uh, uh, finally uh, make our destiny, destiny that was sought, thought by the founding fathers of this country. The founding fathers, for me, was the princess uh, uh, Leopoldina that signed our independence, the princess Leopoldina. Oslin was the, the, the wife of uh, our first emperor, Peter the, the I, but she was Archiduchess of Austria. And, and the colors of the Brazilian flag, uh, green is from Bragança, Bragança family in Portugal, and yellow from the Habsburg in Austria. So, okay. But, uh, uh, so we have Le Princess Leopoldina, José Bonifácio, which was our first prime minister, and the, the emperor Peter II that uh, managed to maintain the country unified uh, instead, uh, contrary to what happened in Spanish America that a lot of uh, many countries uh, surged after the independence from Spain. And our fourth grandfather uh, uh, of, 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 of Brazil was Getúlio Vargas president. That uh, Republic of, uh, started in 1889, but the Republic in the real term, in the real meaning of the term, only begins with Getúlio Vargas in the uh, 1930 revolution. Uh, that's uh, uh, where the Republic and developmentalism really begins. Okay, so until 1977, we have a growth acceleration. 
So it seems that Brazil will enter in the club of high-income countries. But then occurred the external debt crisis in 1979. Uh, it hits not only Brazil, of course, uh, all Latin American countries, but also South Korea, uh, other countries in Asia. Uh, and uh, our growth decelerates very rapidly and uh, too much. Uh, so in the 80s, we had the so-called lost decade in terms of growth. So in the 80s, we have to manage two big problems, the external debt problem and the inflation problem. So this the, during this decade is uh, in the 1989 is when I started my undergraduate course in economics. I, I was just 17 years old and I started to study economy, uh, economics in 1989. 1989 was the year of our first presidential election in last, uh, since 1960. So uh, we have 29 years without presidential election. So we returned to a full democracy in 1989, but we elected uh, uh, Fernando Collor de Mello that had uh, another agenda of economic development. His agenda was very near of Thatcher and Reagan, you know, neoliberalism. So Brazil needs to reduce import tariffs, need to privatize uh, state-owned uh, enterprises, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, uh, and Fernando Collor de Mello tried to, to, to defeat high inflation with a weird economic stabilization plan that basically freezes all financial applications in Brazil for during a year. That of course that plan did not work, but uh, because of that, uh, Fernando Collor de Mello uh, lost uh, uh, support from the people and from the Congress, and he was impeached in 1992. Then his vice president Itamar Franco uh, took power and invited uh, the ambassador of Brazil in the United States. Uh, uh, the sociologist, famous sociologist, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, to be the finance minister. And uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso invited a, a very uh, uh, high quality team of economists to, to design the, the so-called Plano Real. And the Plano Real was finally successful to bring inflation down to one digit level in 1996, we have a one-digit level of inflation per year. So everybody, I, I remember that time, everybody in 1993, 1994, 1995 are very optimistic about Brazil. You know, now we, we had, because of Brady plan, we, America, Latin America had solved the external debt problem in the beginning of the 90s, and finally Brazil had defeated inflation. So Every of us are very optimistic about the future uh, development of Brazil. So, okay, Brazil uh, uh, is, is back to the game. It's, it's what we expected to happen. So that's why Fernando Henrique Cardoso wins two elections in the first term, because this, this climate of optimism that now Brazil uh, will return to its uh, 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 to its fate. It, its fate is, is to, to, to become a, a, a member of high income uh, economies. But unfortunately, as you can, the graph, can see in the graph, uh, during the two terms of Fernando Henrique Cardoso presidency, the, uh, our average growth, uh, average rate uh, growth rate was more or less two and a half percent per year. Very low, very low. Because of these disappointed expectations in the in the two turns, or two rounds of a President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Lula wins the election in 2002. Lula wins in the second round with almost 66% of valid votes, which means two in each three valid votes was to Lula. So again, a new uh, climate of optimism uh, 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 arrived in Brazil. Everybody had a very optimistic uh, humor about the future of the country. Finally, a uh, real worker, 
arrives to power, uh, and we have a, a left, a center left party in, into power. And so we thought that Brazil will restart its economic development and now a more social inclusive economic development. Uh, and uh, this, this is what the expectations. So during the Lula government, we had an, uh, an, 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 a small ex growth acceleration uh, from two and a half percent per year. We accelerate growth to 4% per year uh, in the 10 year moving average in, at the end of the second Lula uh, administration in 2010. So in 2010, Brazilian economy grew 80%. You should remember the economists in 2011 with the, the state of uh, Cristo Redentor in Rio de Janeiro skyrocketing that, okay, now Brazil is, a, is, back to, is back to stage. Brazil is back, okay? Unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, we, uh, after a very successful two mandates of President Lula, under President Dilma Rousseff administration, the economic growth uh, starts to decline. And we have, uh, we start in 2014, our greatest recession since the recession of 1982, 81 to 1983. During the recession uh, that lasts from the second semester of 2014 to the last quarter of 2016, the average loss of GDP was higher than 80%. Okay, So because of this economic situation, I think that as the main reason for the impeachment of uh, President Dilma Rousseffi, uh, and then his vice president assumed, Michel Temer, with again uh, a liberal agenda, and this agenda did not work. So the Brazilian economy, after uh, getting out of the Great Recession of 2014 to 2016, uh, restart growth, but at, a, at a, a lower pace. The average growth rate from 2017 to 2019 was one and a half percent per year, 60 percent lower than the value between 1980 to 2014. That was 2.8 percent per year. So our growth trend growth decelerate after 2017, and well. The rest, you know, we have the COVID, but the, the COVID was not so uh, bad for us. Uh, the Brazilian GDP falls less than 4% when compared, for instance, with Italy or with Spain that have a fall in GDP higher than 10%. Our economic policy response was very good. We have only a, a, a lost of output of 3.5%, less than 4%. It was very good numbers. We then recover in 2021, but in 2022, again, we have low growth. And we have this situation right here that the 10 average, 10 year moving average of uh, per capita economic growth is zero. In, that is worse than the last decade in the 80s. Our GDP per capita now is the same of 2009. Our manufacturing output is the same of 2004, okay? Our GDP now, GDP now returns to the level of 2013. So this is the numbers of the Brazilian economy. This, this is really a disaster, 40 year disaster, okay? Well, this is the long-term evolution of poverty in Brazil from 1970 to 2011. Uh, in 1970, we have almost seven, 70% of our population uh, are poor, but uh, in the next 41 years, the, the share of pov poverty in Brazil reduced a lot to more or less 10% of population in 2011. Uh, oops, what? Uh, oh, oops. Okay. What explains? What explains the Brazilian successful and then disaster? 
Here, you have a table that shows average GDP growth and by sectors, agriculture, industry, and services. From 1950 to 2020, GDP growth at an average rate of 4.4%, agriculture 3.6%, industry 4.3%, services 4.5%. But if you uh, uh, sh split this time period in two sub-periods, 1950 to 1980 and 1980 to, to, to 2020, we can see that on the uh, period of 1950 to 1980, our GDP growth was an average of 7.4%. Agriculture uh, grows only 4.3%. Industry clear leads the, the development. Industry grows at 8.9% and services 7.6%, okay? And if you split this period in another two sub-periods from 1950 to 1973, so the GDP growth was 7.5%, agriculture 5.3%, but manufacturing industry 12.11% average per year. So is the industrialization, fast industrialization of the Brazilian economy. Well, from 1973 to 1980s, uh, the path of uh, GDP growth reduced, and uh, uh, also the path of uh, uh, manufacturing industry growth decreased. But from this period, mainly we have a successful case. The problem is the period of the period of 1980 to 2020 that GDP growth decelerated to 2.3 percent, agriculture decelerated to 3.1 percent, but manufacturing industry only 0.9%. So it starts our deindustrialization because uh, manufacturing industry output is growing lower than GDP. So this is, uh, is deindustrialization. And if we split in, in, in sub periods, we can see, for instance, that uh, uh, the last decade it was not so bad. So the industry uh, grown 1.2% per year, but from 1989, to 2002, that uh, uh, had uh, the governments of Fernando Collor, Itamar Franco, and the two governments of Fernando Cardoso, manufacturing industry only grew 0.8% on average per year. Then on PT uh, era from 2002 to 2014, growth has accelerated to, to 3.5%. Uh, 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 industry growth accelerated, but was less than GDP, so the, the industrialization continued. And from this period of 2014 to 2020, well, this is a, a completely disaster. Okay, what explains the disaster? Well, the main reason for investment in a capitalist society is, of course, profit. Capitalists invest not because they they uh, have trust in government, but because they have the enough incentive to accumulate capital, which means basically the rate of profit. Well, this graph uh, is taken from uh, uh, a working paper, an article now of uh, my friend Adomir Marchetti from uh, the, the state of Rio Grande do Sul and, and his colleagues. Uh, he's a Marxist economist, but he's, a, he's a, uh, not an orthodox Marxist. So he, he made calculations, he made, uh, he made empirical work, not only uh, says what Marx really m means, uh, but uh, he, main, he does uh, very good empirical work. Well, this graph shows that the profit rate in Brazil was more or less stable until 1960. 75 in an order of 40 percent then there is a huge decrease in the profit rate uh from 1975 to more or less 99 and then a little recover but the profit rate uh yes have a, a trend downwards in brazil uh in, in the the the, the middle of 70s and the middle of 80s that can explain why growth rate decelerate 
Well, uh, here we have the decomposition of the profit rate in Brazil. Uh, profit rate is the decomposed in his its components uh, is the product productivity of capital, the profit share, and the capacity utilization. So from 1950 to 12 to 2020, the profit rate falls at a rate of 1.4% per year. The productivity of capital falls at a rate of 1.11% per year. The profit share falls at a rate of 0.05% per year and capacity utilization falls by a rate of 0.23% uh, per year. And we have the... Uh, the numbers for the rest of the periods. Okay, here we have a, a graph that I think speaks for himself. Is a graph that shows the 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 rate of capital accumulation, physical capital, and the profit rate. Well, this graph shows that both rates uh, vary together. It can have a Marxist or post keynesian interpretation. According to the Marxist interpretation, is the trend there's the fall in the rate of profit that causes the fall in the rate of capital accumulation according to the post keynesian view is the other way around is the fall of the rate of capital accumulation that induces the fall of the rate of profit but uh, it's, it's not it's not necessary to to uh, to choose a side on, on this on this controversy but the, the graph shows shows clearly that the rate of capital accumulation is clearly linked to the rate of profits. It's for me makes sense. Okay, okay it's a capitalist economy, rate of profit is, is an important induced to, to, to capital accumulation. Okay, uh, and this another graph uh, shows the relation between the rate of capital accumulation and the rate of investment. Of course, that they very, very, uh, they are very tired one to another. Okay. Oh, this graph, uh, I know that the title is in Portuguese, but the blue line uh, shows the growth rate of output per employed worker, and the red uh, showed the growth rate of capital per worker employed. What this graph means? This graph means that labor productivity depends strongly on the capital per worker. Productivity is not mana from heaven as liberals, uh, liberal economists uh, think in Brazil. If you want to increase uh, productivity of labor employed, you have to increase the quantity of capital per labor employed. It's a very simple, simple idea that came from Calder from his 1957 uh, article on uh, on capital accumulation and, the, and economic growth. Okay, so this table tries to uh, explain the what happens to Brazil in the next uh, in the last thirty years, uh, trying to 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 first to calculate in the in the extreme right is the so-called natural growth rate which is simply the, the sum of the growth rate of productivity with the growth rate of, of employed the population. So, uh, and here, the, the first column, we have the growth rate of, product, of output per worker. The second column, the growth rate of capital stock growth. The third uh, column, the growth rate of uh, employed population. The uh, fourth, column, the growth rate of capital per worker, and then the natural growth rate. We can see that in between the, 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 the whole period, 1994 to 2012, our natural or potential growth rate or more or less 3% per year, okay? But if we split this in two sub-periods, the period of uh, Fernando Hickey Cardoso administration, the natural rate of growth was 2.5% per year, but in the period of uh, PT administration uh, to the two terms of Lula and the first two years of Dilma Rousseff, the natural growth rate had increased to 3 and 53% per year. The main reason for that is that in the, the, the period of 2003 to 2012, that happens 
an increase in the growth rate of output per worker. And this, of course, uh, may, mainly uh, because there is uh, a little increase in the growth rate of capital stock, but uh, uh, since there is a, a decline in the growth rate of employed population, the, the growth rate of capital per worker increase, you know, uh, from 1.35% per year to 1.7% per year. Okay. Well, uh, I, th I think that all of you have uh, saw that movie, Casablanca. Casablanca, the last scene of the movie, the, the French policeman uh, killed the, the German general and he so told to, he, to the, the police, to the, the other police, well, arrest the, the suspects of always, you know? So now, uh, uh, what, what is the suspect of the crime? why Brazil had decelerated economic growth. So uh, let us uh, see what happens with the growth rate of capital stock. Between 1980 to 1984, the growth rate of capital stock was almost 8% per year, then declining to 7%, to 4.28%, to 3.43%, then to 262%, then increase to 2.3%. 0.34% and again to 4.33%. Uh, so between 1980 to 2012, the growth rate of capital stock reduced almost 50%. It's basic, basically capital accumulation. There's no, there's no uh, surprise or anything uh, uh, mysterious in the problem of Brazilian growth. Is capital accumulation. We decelerated the rate of capital accumulation. When we saw the investment rate at cur cur uh, current prices, the investment rate falls from 21 to uh, uh, 26% uh, in 1980 to just 19% in 2012. Uh, and also the productivity of capital reduced from 0.7%. 72 to the last uh, observation that we have to 0.58%. So we have a reduction in investment rate, we have an increase in the price, the relative price of capital, and we have an, a decrease in capital productivity. That that's explains this huge reduction in the growth rate of capital stock. Well, when we, okay, when we ask, why investment is reduced, we have to look to these variables. The uh, degree of capacity utilization, real effective exchange rate, and real interest rate, okay? So uh, investment uh, reduce uh, more or less 11%, but the, the, the suspect, the usual suspect for collecting uh, thought Will, will be the degree of capacity utilization, but sorry, the, this suspect is innocent, you know, <laughs> because the it was, degree of capacity utilization increased 10% in period. Who are the criminals? Two, the real effective exchange rate appreciated 22%, and the real interest rate ex post increased 10,000%. Brazil was a country of low interest rates and turned in the 90s to be a country of high, very high interest rates. Well, personally, uh, my family was favored by that. Okay. Uh, we accumulated our real estate uh, in this period, but uh, for the country, it was a completely disaster. Okay. So I have. So let me see. Uh, there is some comparisons, but this this I would uh, how I can now. Let let's uh, show some graphs. This graph shows uh, in uh, uh, in in blue we have the investment rate, and in red we have domestic savings uh, from I uh, this this. From 2000 to 2015, you can see uh, 
that uh, the investment rate uh, in, in the middle of the two, 2000 uh, increased to more or less 20%, but then it was not sustainable. But it was, it was, was, which is interesting from the point of view of neo-developmentalism is that between 2003 to 2007, Brazil had a current account surplus of more or less one or one and a half percent of our GDP. And then uh, we have a, an increasing uh, uh, current account deficit. Oops, what's, oh, okay. But well, let's skip, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, let me, well, this, this, this graph is interesting. Uh, this graph is not about only Brazil, but about uh, a, a lot of, uh, a sample of countries from 1998 to 1992. This, this series are taken from, from Ross's book of 2001, and uh, shows that the, the rate of domestic saving and the profit share are positively correlated. Okay, well, it's basically an Akaldorian assumption. So uh, it's, it's interesting, but, but not so much interesting. I think that, okay, well, I have a lot. Ah, okay. So this is, I think, the real reason for our um, growth disaster is that this is this is a series uh, that sh show the manufacturing share in GDP from 1947 to 2011. Now, in 1947, the manufacturing share in GDP was 15%. Then, until 1975, the manufacturing share is increasing, up to more or less 22%, and then starts decreasing. Uh, there is a, a tendency to stop the, the, the industrialization in the beginning of the 90s, but... Uh, after the real plan, the industrialization continues. And in 2011, uh, the share of manufacturing industry was below the share in 1947. Today, our manufacturing share in GDP is only 10%. Okay? It's lower than India, for instance. Oh, oops. How does this sink? Travou aqui. Ah, ok. Ok, ok. Ah, uh, ok. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now, his is a more uh, recent data, data on manufacturing uh, share in GDP, is World Bank data. As you can see, uh, there is a, a, a brief period in the beginning of the 21st century that uh, appears that Brazil will reindustrialize. But then after 2005, we have the, the continuing decline in the, the manufacturing share until we arrived uh, to more or less 10% of our GDP. Okay, so the question now is to make this question, why? the industrialization happens in Brazil. Well, in order to try to answer this question, um, I, I written a paper um, two or three years ago with some colleagues, Paulo Gala um, and uh, Luciano D'Agostini, um, that we first estimate uh, the so-called industrial equilibrium exchange rate, which, which is the industrial equilibrium exchange rate. We define industrial equilibrium exchange rate as the level of real exchange rate that maintains uh, a constant share of manufacturing uh, industry in GDP, okay? So uh, we estimate uh, this, that is an, an, an equation. Uh, I think that's two, well, uh, equations here. But the idea is basically, the following, the manufacturing share in period T depends on manufacturing share on the previous period, depends on the real exchange rate on period 
T minus something, uh, which depends, of course, on the estimates of a econometric model, uh, depends on the, the, the index of uh, economic complexity the, developed by uh, Irao and Hausman. Okay. And uh, another term here uh, that depends on real per capita income uh, in level and in square, the idea is to separate premature deindustrialization to from natural deindustrialization the, in the sense of Houghton. The idea that after some level, threshold level of uh, per capita income, there is a reduction in the manufacturing share in GDP because you know high tax services are solving the the, uh, the resources of the economy. So it's natural. So if it's natural, there's no uh, concern about that. Okay. So we estimate this equation and uh, by estimating this equation, we are capable to estimate the real, uh, the industrial equilibrium exchange rate. Well, first two things. First, the industrial equilibrium exchange rate is not a constant over time, it changes. As for instance, we have changes in the economic complexity, which means uh, basically non-price competitiveness, okay? The, the uh, economic complexity index is an index of non-price competitiveness of the Brazilian manufacturing industry. We have also changes in the per capita income. So uh, industrial equilibrium exchange rate is not constant over time. In red, in red, we have the effective real exchange rate. So uh, we can see that from 1998 to 2005, the real, the fact of real exchange rate and the different estimates for industrial equilibrium exchange rate are very close. So we do not have an overvalued exchange rate from 1998 to 2005. After that, there is an alligator uh, mouth that opens in which we have a huge appreciation of real exchange rate and the huge depreciation of industrial equilibrium exchange rate. What does it mean? It means that in order for the manufacturing share to remain constant in time, the required exchange rate is higher and higher each year because it's necessary to compensate the reduction in non-price competitiveness of the Brazilian manufacturing industry. So the idea is very simple. You have price competitiveness and non-price competitiveness. If non-price competitiveness is reduced, you have to compensate with increasing price competitiveness, which means that you have to devalue to your real exchange rate. So this is this huge alligator mouth that opens uh, after 2005, showing that we have a clear and overvalued exchange rate, okay? Well, this is the evolution of the economic complexity index from 2005 to 2017. We have a huge reduction of economic complexity of the Brazilian industry, Brazilian economy, showing that non-price competitiveness our manufacturing industry is being reduced. Okay, then we made a counterfactual exercise. The counterfactual exercise is to compare the actual value of the manufacturing share in red with the uh, the value of the manufacturing share that will be uh, reached if it, in, in, uh, real exchange rate is equal to industrial equilibrium exchange rate. So we have this graph, okay? So uh, then we made, based on these exercises, we decompose our deindustrialization two parts. One that can be uh, attributed to the overvalued exchange rate, and the other that can be attributed to loss of non-competitiveness or, or to the, the decrease in economic complexity. Well, what we uh, achieve is that 61% uh, of the change of manufacturing share was due to reduction of non-price competitiveness, and almost 39% was due to exchange rate overvaluation. Okay. Oh, I have, uh, ah, well, just, just I'm just finishing comparing Brazil with Colombia, uh, Peru, and Bolivia. These are GDP per capita in purchasing power parity. 
uh, as we can see from 2002 to 2020, uh, Brazil uh, clear, is clearly lost its leadership in South America. Colombia has now a uh, uh, GDP per capita that is in purchasing power parity is very near than Brazil. So uh, uh, Brazil is in green, okay? So uh, after 2014, the GDP per capita falls and Colombia reached our GDP per capita in the end of the 2010s, okay? Uh, this is the, okay, is the trade openness of this, these economies. Uh, that means the, the ratio of the sum of exports and imports to GDP. Uh, Bolivia is in red. Uh, Bolivia is the most open economy of the Latin of the South America, and obviously the most poor. Uh, Brazil was the one of the closest economies in South America, but uh, as we can see, uh, there is a movement of openness uh, uh, to trade uh, uh, in Bolivia, Colombia, Brazil, Brazil here. Brazil is in green. But there is a, a movement of trade openness. That's basically the 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 the, the commodity boom in the in the, in the 20s. Uh, but this graph is mo mo is more important. It shows the reduction of the share of manufacturing exports in total exports. In 2002, more than 50% of our exports are manufacturing exports. In 2020, this number was reduced to less than 30%. Brazil returned to be a primary commodity exporter. Okay? Uh, and, uh, well, and then we have this reprimarization and other countries, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, this occurs in all countries of South America. So, well, I have a little more to discuss, but I think that uh, it, it, that's enough. Uh, thank you so much. So, Raghav and, and uh, Gabriel came, came here. So, we have some time for, for questions. Uh, Oslin. You want to make some question because I know that you have to take a flight in. No, okay, okay. If you do not, don't, okay. Ambassador, ah, you are leaving. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you by your presence, Mr. Ambassador. So. Julio, Julio, uh, give a microphone to him. Microphone. Okay. Um, congratulations for your presentation. Very interesting. I think there are many points in common. Uh, I have some. Uh, question or curiosity about uh, all your presentation about the first presentation uh, my general question is, is uh, because of you speak about the history of the structural chain in terms of agriculture industry and service probably uh, could be space to uh, rethink about the category things about digital transformation Digital transformation means services, or in some cases, industry. That I don't know if the traditional category can represent the, this new uh, revolution, like in the case of the uh, uh, digital sector, and if this kind of rethinking can uh, help to uh, in, uh, understand the, what happens uh, in India, because you say that there is a very increase of digital services. No, like something like uh, this. And a question about for Gabriel. Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, I don't know if because there are many data. But it's difficult to reflect. But my general impression is that could be a sort of relationship between uh, the the price elasticity or exchange rate elasticity with the income elasticity. That perhaps this is the the, the why 
uh, uh, for primary goods, uh, there is not this inelasticity, and then there is elasticity for low technology and decrease probably because increase the income elasticity. And uh, uh, the other point is about uh, a sort of uh, Keynesian efficiency of the, the goods. Why? Because of, you start for some classification and you um, consider the impact of exchange rate given this kind of classification. Why you don't try to give a new classification in terms of different elasticity to uh, exchange rate, a sort of, uh, um, because the Keynesian uh, dynamic efficiency, no? you say that uh, um, the structural change is to focus on good that are, uh, that can be, that there is uh, space to sell in the international market. That probably this is a, a new classification that you can uh, make with this kind of, uh, of data. And uh, for um, Jose, um, you show also in your case many data for all representation, but also in your case. And uh, um, uh, one point is that probably the, the, there is a sort of, of Verdorn effect because there is uh, the contrast uh, between industrial capital and financial capital. No, the, the rate, uh, the profit rate is decrease in 80 and up the interest rate. That is the switching between industry, uh, industrial capital to, uh, to financial uh, capital. That is the, uh, my comment or <laughs> mm -hmm. about your presentation. Very interesting, but many data that <laughs> we have time, <laughs> take post. time to, re is to report. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, on oh, no, no. Oslin, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, you're you actually summarizing a lot of the questions that I was having in mind. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, one specific question to Raga: When you are saying uh, we need to think about drivers of growth or development, different the, the sectors of care and providers to care, what what did you mean uh, about the, that letter? Um, yeah, your extended description of the care economy. Uh, and when I listen to both Jose and Gabriel, uh, I, I kept thinking, yes, of course, real exchange rate is important, no doubt about that. And you both are making the case uh, that it's prime suspect or very important, its stability is important. So it was really very telling. But also in both of your uh, analysis, structural change or the deterioration in complexity of what Brazil is producing and exporting uh, is very important. And you have these differentiated elasticities about sectors. If we put yours together, I still think we need to think a lot more about the deep drivers of structural change, which was in your lecture yesterday as well. I mean, I see the point that you need the real exchange rate uh, stability mm -hmm. at a competitive level to give it space for structural change. Without structural change, exchange rate will not cut it, is my um, take on. But this this was, you know, both the numbers in both were very interesting. And Gabriel, your income elasticities, you didn't have any time to talk about that, okay. was also really very, very telling because they were insignificant when it came to uh, high tech or primary goods, whereas yeah. you know, it's elastic for the other stuff we are uh, uh, importing. So very interesting, thank you. Yeah, okay, I think it makes sense. Uh, because now Raga present uh, a figure with the sort of goods and skills about you know, the uh, GDP and the industrial share that you say, no, there is a sort of uh, inverse uh, view. But also Jose present this for, uh, for Brazil at one moment, that uh, the provocation is that, but it's normal, this kind of the industrialization, stress this point, but, but probably the problem is not the industrialization, the problem is the decrease of a complexity that Brazil come back to the agriculture, not 
to go overcome with service sector as a provocation. Uh, just on India, uh, there's a book uh, just recently um, produced by Professor Shashank Bhide and Professor K. L. Krishna. Uh, it's an edited book on India's service sector revenue. The main crux is that they have estimated total factor productivity for the services sector which is around six to seven percent. Uh, and then they say that manufacturing, it's much less, lesser than two percent. And for agriculture, it's still lesser. It's less than one percent. We did some simulations in GCAP and we said, say, for example, if you have same technological of progress of two percent in manufacturing, services and agriculture. You know, which sector came out to be the highest growth and employment uh, 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 highest growth and employment sector, it came out to be manufacturing. So it seems that in India, it is uh, true that we have service-led growth, but it's total factor productivity uh, driven. So tomorrow, if we assume that the technological progress is same, uh, it is manufacturing which will, uh, you know, uh, grow uh, faster. I think you you referred to that in your slides as well that we need to invest in manufacturing, and the share has been stagnant. If you compare it with China, it's 19%, with India not going beyond 14 to 15%, share of industry being around 25%, services are much higher. So we need to do something about the manufacturing sector and probably uh, this industrial policy of Atmiya Nirbhar Bharat. <laughs> People shouldn't constitute that as an import substitution policy. It is uh, it has to go beyond the subsidy regime. And what we are trying to say is that uh, you define it in terms of output and input oriented technological progress in manufacturing and transport and communication rather than a subsidy. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Daniel, make one. Um, I would like to ask a question to, to you. Um, I, I, um, I, I, you said that uh, there is a, a trend in, in India uh, to, to focus on uh, service sector led growth. Uh, and uh, I would like to know uh, your comments on the possibility of uh, looking to the service sector uh, and the manufacturing sector as interacting with uh, each other. Uh, I mean, in terms of share, uh, you can see uh, them as opposed, but um, manufacturing sector uh, is the sector that also um, demands specialized um services and um uh, i would also like to comment that here in brazil we have also this duality and it is something that um, you mentioned in your presentation um when we have uh, when we have an increase in in um income concentration we have also um uh, an increase in the service sector that that is not is specialized here in Brasilia. You are not uh, very, uh, you cannot see this very clearly. But uh, if you go to São Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, you will see this on the streets. Uh, and um, I, I would like to know if this happens in India also. And I think this is one of the explanations, at least in Brazil, uh, of the um, the growth of the service sector and its 
uh, biggest, uh, and because this is the biggest share uh, sector that has the biggest share. Um, and that, that's it. I would like to, to hear your comments. Well, well uh, uh, so let us start. The, uh, who wants to begin? Hagaf? Yep. Okay. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Uh, Julio, yeah, the traditional categories, yes, I, I do agree, you know. But the complexity here is that you have this household manufacturing, household production. That That is the complexity in Indian case, that if you employ less than let's say 100 people you are into you are into household production you know there is a you know there is this people optimize you know they don't want to get into this kind of formal sector by employing more number of workers by reducing the number of workers and making them in contractual and so on so this household nature of production in both manufacturing and services that creates this you know problem of and on the categories that we mentioned is only formal sector, you know, the, the informal units that are all around India, we, we, you know, that they don't even get into the data of central statistical organization and so on. It's, it's, so this, you know, it's kind of a gray area in terms of, you know, self-employed units, self-employed enterprises. It could be a manufacturing unit, it could be a, you know, a service unit. In fact, it could be a high tech service unit. You know, I would be sitting in a, a at home and doing a, a software engineering. You know, uh, that's a self employed enterprise. If, you know. So the categorize categories of this industry services and it, it only analytical categories for our exposition and our analysis. It's extremely complicated. Um, so that's why you zoom into district level, unit level, it's extremely complex. Uh, so there is a limitation, yes, I completely agree that, you know, these categories restrict us from looking at this kind of vertical, horizontal uh, interactions. Uh, Aslam, I was talking about enablers of care. So the, you know, care investment, uh, investment in, Creating care employment is one thing that is a you know pillar of, of the strategy that your strategy. But enablers are, for example, I talked about violence against women. Violence actually impacts care. So you know violence that happens in a household that impacts ability to uh, you know give care. So. And also violence affects intergenerational because if you are not taking care of child, you know, children growing up in violent households, their human capital formation. So there's an intergenerational impact of violence. Violence is one enabler uh, of care. Violence is again, another enabler of, um, of human capital formation. So when we talk about IT and IT enabled services, we also have to talk about care and care enabling services. So if you invest in the enabling services, if you reduce violence, you can actually uh, create more productivity. And uh, so this is the concept that, I, uh, because I worked in violence, I kind of tried to, in your own multiplier estimates, if, if you actually in, uh, take into account the prevalence of violence and calculate the leakage, the care multiplier may be reduced to that extent of, of the, so that's the enabling uh, thing that, and uh, yes, the industrialization policy, yes, this, this is, you know, the, we don't have a proper industrial policy in India, and that's, that's in the making, as, as, as you rightly mentioned, but the, the issue is, you know, the past, I said rethinking industrialization policy, rethinking development, the, the past industrialization policy across the world, it has delinked economy from society. You know, it has disconnected, you know, economy from society. Now, we need to think of industrialization policy in conjunction with care, uh, care led or care supported, you know, social safety net creating industrialization policies. You know, you could not create an industrialization policy as, as in the old times to you know, not to take 
concern not to worry about you know uh, human capital formation or productivity growth there are a lot of deep determinants of human capital that we don't talk about we, you know so the industrialization policy has to think that's what i i call rethinking industrialization policy you can't just blindly say okay i'm going to create more investment you know it has to be in a way that it creates social embeddedness um, and that's 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 the reindustrialization policy manufacturing uh, plus services yes there you know this is you know much of manufacturing you see a fall in manufacturing because they have outsourced a lot of high tech uh, part of manufacturing to the service industry. So some part of rise in service industry, like accounting services, business services, you know, fintech services, all these services are essentially outsourced from manufacturing. It used to be in the manufacturing, but it's been outsourced to the high-tech uh, service sector. So the manufacturing plus services is, you know, the high-tech, high-productivity sectors in both manufacturing and services. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, it, you know, kind of overlap there. It's not just purely, it's service, it's counted in services, but it is coming out of manufacturing, you know, manufacturing, you know, manufacturing units that are producing cars, they need they need to create softwares. You have to have BMW or whatever car you have, you have an app there. So that app is created, that is counted in the service sector. Whereas the manufacturing uh, cars, that, that is in the manufacturing sector, That that is that is for sure. The second thing about duality, I didn't get your point fully. You know, you see the duality in service sector because you have a high productivity, you know, part of the service sector, which does not create more employment or does not absorb a lot of employment from the agriculture sector. Whereas there's a low productivity uh, service sector that, that absorbs a lot of labor and low productivity absorb, it's like security, it's like uh, food, uh, retail, wholesale, uh, hotels, restaurants, and so on and so forth. These are these are actually employing a lot of people who are coming out of agriculture from from rural areas. So this is the duality that I was talking about within the service sector. Yes, yeah. Income, you have the growth of the uh, low productivity service sector. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I showed in one of the slides that the demand for income elasticity of manufacturing, uh, income elasticity of services is increased, and that is domestic demand comes from the top 10%. That's what sustains the. Uh, uh, I, I have the data if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Gabriel? Okay. Thank you very much for the comments. Uh, I don't know if I have the, the answers of, of all the comments, but it's good to think about it. The, the first thing I, I, I want to say or clarify, what is my position about the, the role of the exchange rate or competitive exchange rate in a structural change? I think that it's a partial derivative. I mean, it's one cause that is something that could help but I don't know if I will rely only on change rates in order to get developed. I think that there is more, there are other causes. You have to do industrial policy, you have to do a lot of things, but the thing that I believe, and I strongly believe is you have to avoid overvaluation because if you, if you do not avoid overvaluation, probably all the productive policy or all industrial policy or all the service pro policy that maybe you want to do because you believe that that is the way, it's going to be more complicated to be successful. It's just that because it's like, okay, you are not there. Is one thing that I believe that you have to, in at least in emerging economies or developing economies, you have to try to grow to, and you have to try to, uh, uh, that your tradable sector growth because you, you want to avoid some balance of climate crisis. But, but, but then, I don't know, I'm, we can't expect that the real exchange rate solve everything, but still, if you have a very overvalued exchange rate, it's going to be complicated to do all the kind of industrial policy or whatever. So, related with income elasticity and exchange rate, that and we 
did some analysis about income elasticity in the paper. We focus most about balance of pay payment constraint growth models. So, so we, we try to see if our income elasticity of import are higher or lower than in export are more or less the same. That that only means that you can grow at the at the same pace as your partners. No? I mean, our partners are not developed countries. So if you want to grow faster, probably you are going to have problems. And if you develop the sectors that respond to the real exchange rate, you are going to have some increase in your export elasticity that could help in that sense. I mean, we, we, we didn't really analyze, analyze yet the relationship within the sector that have higher real exchange rate elasticity than income, but we, we know that. I mean, if, if you develop that sectors, you are going to have a higher income elasticity in your exports and in your imports, it's going to be more or less the same. The only thing that we try, I mean, we, we didn't try to change the, the classification because, I mean, we were, was okay to use the, 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 the common classification and try to say, okay, these sectors may be important for growth as, Rod as Roderick thought or other people thought that are modern sectors. But we did group the real exchange elasticity by the intensity, the labor intensity of each sector. Why? Because we believe that the sectors that are going to respond more to real exchange rate are the labor intensive sectors. Why is that? Because labor is an in this sense, no, uh, for, for the, in the, from the point of view of, of exporters, is the main non tradable cost. So the labor intensive sectors are going to have a higher increase in profitability and probably they are going to expand more the, 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 the export. And we find actually that that, I mean, that classification, if we divide between intensive sector and non intensive sector, the, the, the real change rate elasticity is. It's very different. And the, I mean, I did my thesis about real exchange rates, export and imports. And I think that there is other kind of things that they are not in this paper. Like for example, the real exchange elasticity, elasticity also depends on the capabilities that the economy has. No? In sense, in the product, product space, sense of the value of Hausmann. I mean, you can't develop a sector if you don't have any kind of capability in that sector. So you are only are going to develop that, those sectors that is close to, to the sector that you are already competitive. In that sense, it's like the elasticity that, that, that we are getting in Argentina probably is different, different than the elasticity of other countries because they have different kind of, of capability. So I think that the next step if I continue the study about real exchange rate, that I don't think that is going to be the case, but it's going to be impressive, is to try to replicate this paper to different kind of, of, of countries and, to, and try to analyze the difference between the real exchange rate elasticity depending on the productive structure of each country. So I think that can come. we are going to continue talking later, but thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, first the, the two questions of Julio. Uh, yes, uh, I think that the main problem of the Brazilian economy, why we uh, uh, get stuck in this middle income track is uh, uh, a financialization problem. As I shown in my, in my graph, uh, uh, after the plan, real plan, Brazil starts to have very high positive interest rates. So, uh, it, so it, yes, we have financialization, but uh, uh, finance, financialization only will not be capable to explain all the problems. Why? Well, uh, first of all, because until the beginning of the 21st century, the manufacturing industry had three times more share in GDP than in financial sector. So uh, they are much more people than the financial sector though. So, and, and more important. So if they act together, they can have uh, more, uh, uh, more, more impact over the Brazilian economic policies than they actually had. But uh, financialization in Brazil 
came hand by hand with the growth of the primary sector, you know. Uh, and then in the 90s and the 2000s, and that's the beginning of the 21st century, the soybean production increases a lot. For, for you, you know the importance of the soybeans production now in Brazil. In the first quarter of 2023, the production of soybeans increased 20% compared to the same period of last year. And due to that, the GDP growth of the Brazil economy in the first quarter was 2%. So and now lies at the growth rate of 8%. This will not be sustainable because, okay, the, the, the harvest occurs on the first quarter. But in order for you to know the importance of the agribusiness sector in Brazil, and the agribusiness sector is not interested in industrialization, okay? And they prefer to have a uh, real exchange rate appreciation. They love real in, high real interest rate because they in order to deposit their savings without risk so that is one part of the problem uh regarding the uh the nature of the, the of the, the industrialization of brazil uh of course the brazilian industrialization is not natural it's a premature industrialization uh, uh there is well, um, Hodrick defines premature deindustrialization in a, some sense ad hoc way. You know, uh, the, uh, premature deindustrialization is an deindustrialization that occurs uh, before a certain threshold level of uh, per capita income. There was the per capita income of developed countries reach when they start uh, to deindustrialize. For, for instance, England, the United States, they started, so to speak, to deindustrialize with more or less fifteen thousand uh, dollars per year of a per capita income uh, in prices of the nineteen seventies. So th this, but this is an ad hoc definition. I prefer this one. Premature deindustrialization occurs when the economy starts to deindustrialize before reach the Leo's point, which means that the economy starts to deindustrialize having a large share or its working force in the subsistence sector that can be urban subsistence sector. And this in Brazil, the, the subsistence sector, as we can see, even in this paradise island, which is Brasilia, is in the urban areas, okay? So that's the, the, the definition of premature industrialization in Brazil. Regarding the Oslin uh, question about uh, structural change, what my, my, what my numbers uh, show it, that uh, uh, more or less 40% of the negative structural change in Brazil was due to overvalued exchange rate, but 60% is related to other things. So what these other things are? Ma a lot of many things. First, reduction in the uh, public investment. Okay, uh, we have also the increase in the interest rates that reduce the incentive for uh, investments in modernizing the, the capacity of manufacturing industry. So I think that we have a lot of, of, of things that explains uh, the 60% that ca cannot be explained by real, uh, real overvaluation of ex exchange rate, but uh, uh, real overvaluation is an important thing. Not the only answer, but it's important. So uh, uh, I think that Luis Carlos had a, a question. So, uh, so yes, he had a question, but... but Oriero, question for you. You showed a uh, move about the payoff of economic Brazilian growth presentation. Uh, you explain this fact mainly because of the low investment in fixed capital. My question is, you can, is possible to explain the underdevelopment only economic pattern? Where is the class history? Where is the underdevelopment state theory? How? We can think uh, the desindustrialization, uh, 
the, the grow of um, high grow uh, tax um, interest rate level of the Brazilian economy. If you don't think about a lot of issues, you have a long uh, tradition in um, CEPAL structure and steel. Okay, Luis Carlos. Um, of, uh, well, my, I, my my presentation is uh, uh, regarding the economic uh, reasons of our uh, premature industrialization and uh, low growth. But for sure, that there are a, a, a class struggle in Brazil. We saw this in the last twenty to thirty years. Um, uh, when I was at Paraná and the Federal University of Paraná, and I make some uh, consulting to the uh, federal the, to the Indus Federation of the State of Paraná, uh, our common friend Gina Palladino, Gina Palladino, our common friend, uh, create a, a very funny expression uh, to to explain what in two thousand and six we are clearly seeing that is the premature industrialization. She uh, talk about an, uh, an alliance of Febraban, Febraban is the Federation of Banks, with Bolsa Familia. Bolsa Familia is our major uh, social system program. So this alliance of Febraban and Bolsa Familia means this thing. Uh, with uh, not too much money, more or less, 50 billion reais per year at that time, what is today 10 billion euros per year, is possible to give uh, social assistance to almost 40 million people in the country. The, since this was done by Lula government, this program allowed the, the government to remain in power for, for many, many elections. You know, but it's a very popular program and a cheap one. You do not need much, much, much money to, to make this program to a very large number of people. So it's, it's a very efficient program because you benefit millions of Brazilians with this social program. But there is a compromise implicit that uh, the, the, the class compromise is the following. Okay, Lula, we, the dominant class, allowed you to have this money for the poor. We do not, we do not care, it's cheap, okay? But the macroeconomic policy is ours, okay? So during Lula administration, we had as a president of Central Bank, a former director of Bank of America, a Brazilian that is, was a former director of Bank of America. And uh, this explains that this is the huge contradiction of the two governments of Lula, that we have uh, at one side a very large increase in social assistance, but at the other side, you have, uh, when you take in consideration the country risk premium, uh, even more higher interest rates than you have under Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Because the, the country risk premium after 2003, 2004, just fall, falls droply, very fast. Uh, in 2013, the MBI plus for Brazil was more than 1,000 base points. But then it falls to 300, point, 300 base points. So you have a huge decrease in the, the country interest in the uh, risk country. Uh, uh, the, the risk premium of, of Brazil, and hence the interest rate differential was much higher in Brazil during Lula's government than during uh, Fernando Cardoso government. So you have this, this compromise. This compromise worked well during Lula, but when Dilma Rousseff assumed the presidency of Brazil, she tried to uh, to break the compromise. So she wants 
to uh, to 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 have the the macroeconomic policy for her, and she tried to reduce interest rates and to to devaluate the real exchange rate. So, so the compromise breaks down under Dilma or Safi. At the same time, because premature industrialization, the end of commodity boom, and so on and so forth, the uh, output growth rate slows down. So people in Brazil becomes anger with Dilma Rousseff because under Lula, they have, uh, they form uh, many expectations of increasing the standard of living that under Dilma Rousseff administration, they are simply cannot accomplished, okay? So uh, Dilma lost her popularity. She managed to win the elections of 2014, but just for little. And uh, in 2015, she was convinced by the dominant classes in Brazil to make a huge fiscal adjustment with the reduce, reducing in the public investment and in 35%. So this is the main cause of the Brazilian crisis. The, the, the recession started in 2014, the second semester, but the policies that Dilma Rousseff adopted in the first year of her second term mandate have amplified the, the, the recession, uh, making what was supposed to be a small recession, a great recession, almost a depression. You know, so there is the impeachment of Dilma, and with the impeachment of Dilma, liberal economists and the traditional classes in Brazil thought, okay, they are defeated. Now it's our time to make the things that we want to make. Remember the declining rate of profit? How is possible to, to recover the rate of profit? Well, you can recover the rate of pro profit in three ways. You can increase the capacity utilization. For this, you have to increase aggregate demand. We have to increase the, so the productivity of capital. So for that, you have to reduce the relative price of investment. But it, it's possible, but demands a tax reform, that, which is now being discussed today. Okay, you can So you can reduce the, the, the relative price of investment, or you can increase... The, the exploration of labor force. So, why are the reforms approved? During Temer administration, a labor reform that reduces the labor's rights. So, the idea was to increase, to use a Marxist term, the rate of exploitation of labor force in order to increase the profit share and all other things remaining constant to increase the profit rate. So, and uh, this is, was the agenda of Temer. But this agenda was not successful. And in 2018, Lula, despite all the corruption scandals that occurred in Brazil uh, in 2014, 2015, 2016, due to the, the so called car wash operation that is uh, very uh, like uh, the Mani Poluti in Italy, okay? Uh, despite of that, Lula was the favorite to, to win the election. But then, because uh, maneuver of the legal system, he was put in jail. And then, uh, 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 PT have to launch Fernando Daddi to be the president of Brazil. Well, uh, in January 2018, I really believe that the president to be elected will be Geraldo Alckmin, the actual vice president of Brazil. Uh, he was at that time uh, at PSDB, the same party of Fernando Henrique Cardoso. I really believe that. But unfortunately, there is an event in, uh, I believe, September, 6th of September, 2018, that uh, someone, uh, some crazy person, we don't know, uh, attempt to kill Bolsonaro, and then he simply won the elections. Bolsonaro was the 
the the the the final attempt of the Brazilian elites and the liberal economists to set their agenda. For race of God, uh, Bolsonaro chose a very incompetent economist to be the, the minister of economy, Paulo Guedes. I have worked uh, with Paulo Guedes many years ago when I was a professor at a private faculty in Rio de Janeiro, Ibemec, and I know him. And when uh, people so, uh, tell that uh, Paulo Guedes is what will be the, the Minister of Economy, I thought for myself, well, there's no, there's no even a chance for this government to, to go as well. <laughs> I know the guy, so I'm, I'm very calm because I know that this, this government simply will not work and did not, okay? But uh, now Lula wins but with a divided country. Uh, the reasons for this are no economic, you know? Uh, Bolsonaro uh, moves uh, so, uh, uh, a cultural war against the left uh, parties, and he uh, gets more than 48% of votes in the second term. The, the difference between Lula and uh, Bolsonaro was just 2%. Okay, what's, what's, it is very, very, very small. So the, the actual situation of class struggle in Brazil is that Lula win, but he had to make compromises with other sectors of society. So uh, in order to govern, because if he did not make compromises, it would be impossible for, to, to, to rule the country. Okay, so... Uh, we are now discussing a tax reform. This tax reform will be, will be fundamental for the manufacturing industry because Brazil, the, our tax system is so crazy that we are exporting taxes, you know, uh, because uh, the, there's a lot of cumulative taxes uh, uh, in the productive chain in manufacturing industry that simply makes uh, exports non-competitive even if you have a competitive real exchange rate. So the, this tax reform is absolutely necessary. But this tax reform uh, will hit the interests of the service sector and the ag agribusiness sector. So uh, I think that this tax reform will pass on the Congress. Uh, the question is what tax reform will pass? Because the evil one, the, the, the original uh, uh, constitutional amendment, uh, previews a, a flat system in which all productive sectors of the economy pays the, the same contribution to the to to the tax system. You know, so the the burden of taxes will be equally shared with uh, agriculture sector, manufacturing sector, and the service sector. Today. Uh, manufacturing share pays more than 50% of indirect, tax, indirect taxes. And uh, agribusiness that have more or less the same share in GDP pays less than 5%. So, and services, well, a little more, 10%. But I have the, the, the graph, but it's, 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 when you look the data, you, uh, you understand that uh, besides the problem of real exchange rate uh, uh, overvaluation, there is a tax system that is against the manufacturing industry. And this represents the economic interests of other sectors, service sectors, ag ag agribusiness sectors, that we have to defeat them on the National Congress in order to pass this tax reform and to have at least a chance to reindustrialize this economy. The tax reform is fundamental. If Lula managed to pass this tax reform, more or less at, uh, as, as it was initially proposed, then we have a chance to reindustrialize the economy. Another reforms will be necessary, but the tax reform is fundamental. Okay, so people, uh, it's time. It's almost six o'clock. Uh, many thanks for uh, all of you that have been in person with us up to now and to all the people that are singing, are broadcasting in the 
Federal Council of Economics YouTube channel. Many thanks. And uh, tomorrow we will have the third and last day of our international workshop. Many thanks to all of you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good one. Good one. Lots. <laughs>